Hello, everyone. Welcome to the National Gallery. Um, thank you for joining us today for this wonderful event as part of the Association for Art History's Art History Festival. My name is Priyash Mistry. I'm the Associate Curator for Modern and Contemporary Projects here at the National Gallery. But I also sit as a member of the Museums and Galleries Committee um, for the AAH. So I'm really honoured to be presenting uh, and introducing Joy this morning as these two worlds sort of collide this weekend. Um, it's a really pleasure to see so many of you here in person today, uh, especially <laughs> given the last 18 months that we've been in. Um, and also pleased that you've um, come to hear Joy talk about her really important but beautiful practice. Um, I'm going to give a quick intro to Joy. Uh, hopefully I'll keep it very brief and then hand over for Joy's uh, talk this morning. Joy Gregory is a London-based artist born in the UK of Jamaican heritage. She graduated from Manchester Polytechnic and the Royal College of Art as, and is engaged with themes that connect both social and political issues around historical and cultural differences within our society. Her important work explores the impact of European history and colonization on global perspectives of identity, memory, folk, and traditional knowledge primarily using um, lens-based mediums, such as photography and film, across many different formats and forms of display, Joy reveals fascinating histories um, through her research and has undertaken many prestigious commissions, fellowships, and residencies, including the Nesta, Fe uh, the Nesta Fellowship and at the Black Cultural Archives and Autograph ABP. She currently teaches fine art photography at Camberwell School of Art, University of the Arts London, and has been Honorary Research Associate at the Slade School of Art at UCL. Joy has been the recipient of numerous awards, receiving an Honorary Fellowship um, of the Royal Photographic Society in 2019, and has had the opportunity to have her work exhibited globally, having participated in numerous festivals and biennials. Her, work, uh, her works are also included in multiple collections um, around the world, including those of the Arts Council Collection in the Victorian Albert Museum here in um, the UK, the Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane, uh, Australia, and the Yale Centre for British Art in New Haven, Connecticut. So with that, it's my great pleasure, and uh, please do join me in welcoming Joy Gregory. Thank you so much, Priyash, for such a wonderful introduction. And thank you all so much for coming here this morning. And I've, I mean, for me, it's quite early. So I hope, <laughs> I don't know if it's early for you too. Um, I'm immensely um, uh, pleased um, that I've been invited to speak as part of this festival of art history. And um, I'm obviously not going to talk about all my work because I've been practicing for such a long time. But I want to talk about uh, particular stories um, within my practice um, and stories that I've been told. Um, I'm going to start off with um, self-portraits and people who've known my practice for a long time know that I actually spent at least, I think, the first 10 years, if not more, of actually of, of my practice actually making self-portraits without actually thinking about them as self-portraits. And this is a very um, early um, self-portrait where I'm sort of like an invisible person. And I think um, when I first started, I, mean, I never actually thought about it as, as making pictures of these pictures of myself as being self-portraits. But I suppose they are, but they're more like an internal thing. Um, this I, I made when I was at the Royal College. Um, and it's usually because nobody else was around for me to photograph. Um, so I ended up putting myself in the picture. But I think about, I think looking back at it now, um, I spent much of my early um, life uh, trying to disappear um, because I grew up in a small town where we were one of um, very few black families. Um, and you know, if you ever did anything wrong or if you ever did anything exceptional, or not even exceptional, just anything very normal, um, people would always know that it was you and they could tell your mum or, or, you know, and, and like at that age, you just really want to be like everyone else and I could never be like everyone else. So um, I suppose that the, the work that I was making at that stage was sort of like a reflection of, of that. And, and even when I was making these, um, 
constructed interiors. I wasn't a great person for going outside and making pictures, and I quite liked the idea of being able to combine um, painting um, with photography, and so I spent ages doing building these sets and then painting them. And that physicality was really important to me within my practice and still remains that way. Um, much later on, um, once I'd left um, study, um, I continued doing these self-portraits um, and continued do, um, using the idea of materiality within the practice. Um, and at that time, you know, with those self-portraits, it was all more about women in space and an interior space, um, but never actually looking out at or confronting the camera um, in any way. These are um, with uh, liquid light, most of these. Um, and again, sort of like not really looking at the camera um, and, and always in black and white at that stage. Previously, I'd only ever worked in colour. But you know when you know you work with what you have access to, and at that time I was working at North Paddington Community Darkroom, so I had access to a darkroom, um, and and actually the control of your medium from sort of um, making the pictures and photograph, making the photographs, constructing the ideas around the photograph, to actually printing it was really important for me, and I think in some ways remains that way, because for me photography is like a whole. Um, language in its, itself um, within that practice of it, with both the material and the image. Um, this is probably the image that I'm probably most well known for, which is um, Autoportrait, which was, from, was my first ever commission um, and for an exhibition at Camera Work, um, which, and it was commissioned by Autograph, a very fledgling um, autograph at that point. Um, and I thought I would use the opportunity to actually, again, talk about myself um, and my experience and sort of like that, the, the experience I had of growing up um, in the UK and never actually seeing pictures of myself um, within the um, context of fashion and beauty. And not just me as an individual, but people like me. Um, and I think the only person within that context I ever saw was... Um, I don't remember her name, but I mean, like, it was only ever one um, fashion model, and she was, you know, displayed as um, an ex or pre presented as something exotic. And it wasn't like I didn't want to be exotic. I wanted to be ordinary. I wanted to be like everybody else. Um, but with with this, it was sort of like putting myself within that context. So I, I mean, I was obsessed when I was growing up, like a lot of people, with um, fashion and beauty magazines and. I mean, like, whenever I could get my hands on, I spent time in the library looking at Vogue and, thinking, and dreaming of working at Vogue, um, but never actually managed to do that. Um, so with these photographs, I'm actually confronting, looking straight out at the camera with just one image, but they were always in that um, earlier configuration of, of nine, of um, three across and three down. Um, but they have been shown since as these individuals of it, um, pictures and, and the process in these was really important as well um, so they're black they're actually black and white but what I've done with the um, the material is um, I've I've used a lith developer with a highly silvered paper and what that does is it splits you get a split tone and it gives you like a skin tone and the idea of talking about skin was central to this work and really important to my practice at that time and skin, obviously skin colour. And I, I, and I should say that when I, I mean, like I didn't, you know, there was no magic involved in taking these pictures. I actually worked with um, another fellow photographer, um, Christina Pisa, who, and so I set it up with Christina in the picture. I don't have to think about how I did it before and I've done it again since that. And then I would go and stand in her place and she would actually press the shutter. Um, these ones are, are with a, a cable release and that they when I was traveling a lot. And I tended to take pictures when I was traveling a lot. Um, but I did continue taking these self-portraits, which I then moved into um, other parts of my practice. So this is from a series of works called um, The Honeymoon Project. And it came out of um, um, a project I was working at, um, not a project I was working at with students at um, Stafford University, well, Stafford University now, Stoke on, it was Stafford Polytechnic at that time, um, and we were invited to participate in um, a project with an artist called Meralda, who was doing work to celebrate um, 
1992 Olympics in, in, in Barcelona. So we went and um, became part of his honeymoon project. Uh, and this is the work I produced for that. I mean, I, I'd said at the end of, um, I don't know, it was like in the 90s, I decided I was never going to take another self-portrait again, and that was the end of it. I was never doing any more. And then many years later, um, I was going through some um, 35 mil um, film, like putting together an exhibition um, with um, Impressions Gallery, Impressions Gallery, sort of like a mini retrospective. And um, I found that these self-portraits that I'd taken when I was traveling around the Caribbean, and I realized I did them because I was thinking about, um, you know, the, 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 I mean, there was no internet. Well, there was internet then, but, but I knew only two people with email addresses. Um, you never phoned anybody. And, and I remember I was actually terrified everyone at one stage, because I, I think I was in Guyana, and I thought, oh, I, it was really cheap to send, um, Telegrams. So I sent loads of my friends telegrams, and they thought, "Oh my God, there's something really wrong. She ran out of money." I mean, like, and because there was no way of actually contacting people. So, in a way, I suppose my 35 mil camera at that time became my friend. So everywhere I went to, I recorded myself um, within these pictures, and, and looking, I suppose, quite pensive in them, and they're quite performative in in many ways. So this is in Haiti. I think it's in Paramaribo, <laughs> in uh, Suriname. Um, and, and, and this project, Memory and Skin, um, was, you know, it was sort of like a, a, a project that really shifted my practice away from myself and away from just thinking about my own experience to actually looking outside of that experience. And it was, it was, through, it was an, another commission um, uh, for Photo 98. And, um, and I was quite, I feel I was quite lucky at that stage. I got money for the commission for Photo 98, so that was the money. Then I also got some money from the Art Foundation um, because I'd won the prize for photography that, that, that year. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, thought I can actually go and do something that was quite ambitious. And so I decided, and, I, and it was recent, it was not long after I'd actually been to um, Jamaica with my parents on my first ever trip to Jamaica. So, so like Jamaica for me was like this um, magical space that I would never ever get to enter. Um, and it lived in my parents' imagination. And I, in a way, I suppose the place that they left behind continued to be real within their imagination because when we went to Jamaica together, I think they were terribly disappointed that it wasn't the place that they'd left behind. But I became really curious about the way in which the Caribbean had been presented. And so I wanted to go back and make and look at stories of um, not just Jamaica, but the whole of the Caribbean as this constructed space. Um, but to, to look at the relationship between Europe and the Caribbean, and that was the basis of the work that for, for Memory and Skin. So I traveled to Haiti, I went to Havana, and, and, and just sat down and, and listened to people's stories. I mean, I mean and, I, and I've sort of based myself mainly in, in Havana and in, in Cuba, um, just because it was the easiest way to actually get around the Caribbean. The thing about the Caribbean, it has, um, so it's a very, I mean, like it, I suppose, uh, in relative terms, it's actually quite a small space um, that goes from sort of like up by Miami and then all the way down to um, to Venezuela, to you know, to, to South America. So it's it's it, it, it's a bridge across all of the Americas, but it's incredibly divided by language, by geography, and the impossibility of being able to get from one place to another. So every time, I think even now, if you want to go. Um, say to, I don't know, from Jamaica to Trinidad, you have to either go through um, America or you have to come back to Europe. You, you can't just go. <laughs> and the only place that I could actually work out through that was actually from Havana, which was like really strange because it was like the, almost a pariah within the, the Western Hemisphere. Anyway, so I did, th did that and, and I discovered lots of different things about um, the impact of um, colonialism, but also how people actually saw themselves. So, and, and also how people behave. So these are like, at that type stage in Havana, it was really difficult to get hold of. People didn't have plastic bags. People didn't have food. People, you, know, you, know, you didn't go shopping. So to have a plastic bag, which these are all drying in the sun, was a sort of um, like a status symbol. Um, I, I went to the, um, into the interior of Suriname and, and met um, descendants of the, of maroon 
uh, people um, who were the runaway slaves. Um, but, but then the people who took me there were missionaries and they, there was like this exchange thing that goes like you'd shift your um, religion and we will you know, provide you with education, health care. And, and, and so it's all very, I mean, like it, I think people know that it's not for real or whatever, but it, 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 for me it was quite disturbing that these things were still going on um, in, and, you know, in, in my lifetime. Um, again and looking at other people at people's family snaps and things and so what i was doing is like creating visual stories and not um actually putting any text or saying any stories around that but letting people read their own things into that except through um except through um sort of like the text which was in the cabinets that i showed um which i'll i'll, I'll show an installation of the work a little bit later um, and then obviously from the other side, sort of like the black presence within Europe, or the, and I'm not saying black, but sort of like people from around the world, but that come from the Caribbean or from Asia that were in, in Europe. And, and the people that remained behind in, um, in the Caribbean to sort of like, you know, so Elfrida was a curator. There were very few curators, very few critics. Um, Rocio and Romana, Romina, who couldn't understand why I couldn't speak perfect Spanish. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, so I, I mean, like, I didn't really take my camera out until, like, you know, several days into a conversation um, because I wanted to try and capture the story as well, and the people and for people to feel comfortable around me as well. Um, so, you know, Florence was a, was a very well-known artist um, who was based in Havana. And, and this is the first iteration of the exhibition um, which was at Huddersfield Art Gallery. Um, and the, the work travelled and it was incredibly well received. And, it, and I'd never done work like that before. So I, it, when I imagined making it, I was imagining making a, a single installation, um, whereas in, a, 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 a series of photographs, whereas in fact I ended up making an installation with lots of objects um, inside it. I realise I'm, I'm going to run over time, so I'm going to run through some of these quite quickly. So the, and each of the cabinet, there were nine of them actually related to a, a major issue within the Caribbean, so skin. And then I made this wall of Proyella, which um, the blue was the representation of the, the Atlantic, and the little crosses was from a story um, where, where um, if, on the island of Wissant, they, if they it was a fishing island. If they didn't have a body to bury, then they would use one of these as a representation. And so I made hundreds of them um, in different skin colours to to show the or to represent the um, shift um, of people's um, lives and experience of the generations down in the present, um, as you know that that's been caused by the. Uh, European expansion and colonialism within the Western world. And I also made a little film called um, Memory and Skin, which I'm going to show you a little of now, um, I hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Right. I'm going to read some of the texts from the cabinets. Um, Havana, Cuba, 1997. We go to eat at a peso restaurant. The waiter refuses to serve me. He thinks I am Cuban and he does not like the colour of my skin. The Dominican Republic tells the story of its own brown colour, where the taint, or tint, is created from a mixture with the Indian. The Aboriginal people of Hispaniola were wiped out by the arrival of the Europeans. Central to this tale is the rejection of the Negro. Trade routes. In the 16th century, one in 10 of the population of Lisbon was of African descent. In the Americas, Europeans repeated what they had created in Africa. One group of people would toil while another reaped the profits. This is the origin of the exploitation colony. Yard. The yard is a dense melting pot that cooks together several religions and beliefs, new worlds and dance steps, unforeseen dishes and musical styles. The yard is a result of the plantation and home to those to all those who left behind another life to seek their fortunes or to just survey. In the yard, people are born and they die. They recite verses, they argue, they listen to the radio, they gossip, play cards or dominoes. The yard is the major cities of Western Europe. Tobacco and sugar. 
to smoke from the same pipe, to inhale snuff from the same pouch, to exchange cigarettes, all of these are rites of friendships and communion, like drinking the same wine of breaking the same bread. Sugar is the child of capitalism and scientific measures. The cane field equals units of surface, sugar and stalks equals weight, liquor plus molasses equals volume, ovens plus boilers equals heat, crystallization viscosity. Memory. On the French island of Wissant, there is a ritual which involves the making of a wax cross to represent the body of a lost one at sea. This cross is called a proyella. In the case of extreme tragedy, one proyella can represent thousands of souls. Memory is said to be individual. The voices may differ from one to the other, but what is, ex is expressed is collective. As I walk past the candles, I am seized by a great urge to blow them out. Trade two. All beautiful things have sad destinies. Jane Rice. Marigot, Haiti, 1997. I'm talking to a woman about her life when a group of men approach. To tell her she is not to speak to me as I'm a journalist. They do not believe I'm an artist. Artists sing, draw and paint. Journalists make money out of their misery. They have spoken to many journalists, but their lives never changes. All beautiful things have sad destinies. While Carlos and I wait for the truck to take us back to Jack Mel, a giant jeep zooms in search of a story. The huge wheels churn dust all over the freshly laundered clothes of the villagers. All beautiful things have sad destinies. Land. The taking of soil from home with you on a journey ensures that you will return. The Caribbean young blacks often refuse to do agricultural work because of its association with slavery. Yet a small plot of land for the slave represented free time and something to re that remained of the family name. The military invasion of the Falklands was a reminder to all tiny islands are vulnerable to the lust of outsiders. The US invasion of Grenada signaled the end of centuries long loyalty to Great Britain from its former, comma, it, from its former Caribbean empire. Women. Women of the Caribbean, both black and white, had to be socially constructed to facilitate the agro-commercial for enterprise. Landless white women sold into the state, by the state into colonial servitude. Landless white women unfit for marriage by propertied males and disqualified from dis domestic service. Landless like white woman dismissed manual labor on the plantations where she socialized intimately with the slave, enslaved community. Landless white woman, she set up her household with an enslaved black man. Their children were born free, unlike their cousins born to their black aunt. Food, a necessary diet equals 20 ounces of bread a day, a quart of oatmeal porridge for breakfast, two days a week, one quart of pea soup, two days a week, half a pound of beef, one pound of potatoes, two pounds a week, two days a week, one pound of potatoes, one day a week, one quart of ox head soup. Caribbean deficits, the local food popular and population imbalance is dangerous. The cause of this is centuries of preoccupation with cash crops, an introduced overpopulation, degraded physical environment. All this can be traced back to colonial control. Uh, Lost Histories um, is one of the works that actually came out of the research that I did in the Caribbean. And it's not so much the research as sort of like looking at things, but it was the research in, in terms of how it changed me and changed in how I looked at things. And so <coughs> Lost Histories was like a series of um, small narratives, very t tiny pictures, um, which I showed in, um, in, in Cape Town at the National Gallery. Um, because I thought I needed to make a work which actually wasn't something that was transplanted, that actually had a relationship with that space. But So I thought I had to make something that all colonised people could relate to. Um, and, and, it was a, and each one just had a title, so this one's sort of like to seek a position. Um, and this one is sort of like families too, where people would bring their own stories and their own translation into that space. Um, and I think the same with Cinderella Tours Europe. Cinderella Tours Europe came out of um, 
memory and skin. And well, not so much memory and skin, but the stories that I um, heard when I was there of the so many people in the Caribbean that you know knew everything about Europe, but yet people in Europe knew very little about them and their lives. And they and I wanted to make like these picture postcards, and so these shoes were almost like the people I interviewed wrapped up who would never have a chance to come here to do a tour of Europe, the same as the Grand Tour that was done in many centuries earlier by privileged people. And they were all places that were instantly recognised. Um, and I'm, I realise I'm running out of time quite quickly anyway. But um, so th this work, um, Science of Africa, um, I was, came out of another commission where I was asked if I would, um, for an exhibition in, um, in Barcelona, if I would make um, a piece of work or make some pictures, or go and take some pictures, actually go and take pictures of the African presence in, in London. And I thought, yes, well, what you're asking me to do is, is definitely different from what I'm going to do. So I know that what they were, they were asking me to do, because they'd commissioned um, photographers in every major city of Western Europe to go and take photographs of the African presence. And what they wanted me to do was to go down to Brixton Market and take people, pictures of black people shopping. But I thought, I ain't going to do that. Um, so I thought, well, I'd, what I'd like to do is talk about the African presence in London in a historical sense and went back into the archives and, and, and then also went and photographed the sites that were uh, referenced within these archives around London and made the piece of work that was, um, I imagined being sort of like on billboards, but actually, you know, in reality, it was like we, had a, we each had a very small space within the gallery. But um, I think luckily, sometime later, um, this is not a gateway, actually did put make the, a few of them into posters which we put up in East London. But it was the idea of actually bringing together um, the past with the site and to, to talk about London having an extremely, you know, thousands of years of, of, of an African presence through trade and things and, and, and to, to, to reflect on that and, and not to just think about people arriving just now. I don't really think I've got enough time to talk about the Kalahari as much as I'd like to, but I mean, I will show you the work. So I've been working um, in the Kalahari for, um, I think, probably close to 20 years. Um, and I started off working with these two sisters, um, Uma, Uma Kais and Uma Una, who, um, it, it, it's really a, it was about endangered language, or well, that's how I started off the work, was about endangered language, and the, the fact that they, um, that they were, had lost or buried their language um, um, because they were not allowed to speak it. But what also came out of that story was they were also, that as children, they were exhibits in the 1936 Empire Exhibition, which took place um, in Johannesburg. And, um, and this is, I mean, like it was, it, for me, it was like really mind-blowing actually to be in the presence of something that I thought was long since buried and forgotten um, but it was like a living history and so that story was, was really important to me the, the story I mean, because the loss of the language was sort of like part of that and and when they went to to um, to, the, to uh, Johannesburg the people that were they because they, they were treated almost um, like a, they were not almost, but they were treated like a curiosity. So they lived on a Bushman camp. They did, uh, you know, Bushman dances. I mean, like it was just um, insane. They were telling me all these things. And then I was, I had a, a fellowship at the University of Itzvatisrand, and so therefore had access to the medical school and to some of the material. And I found the head cast of Kais within that, um, but uh, to which they don't have any access to that material at all. And I, and I was trying to think about how I could actually make a piece of work that would relate to that. And so this is Vitz, this is the playing field where the Empire Exhibition took place um, today. Um, and these are, so, so in collecting the stories, I you know, um, photographed the people I was working with. Um, so this is uh, Upa Andres, um, Uma Joanna, um, Faiki and the little uh, daughter, um, Magdalena, who was um, my translator, and Uma Joanna, who was her mother. Um, and this is like many years later, this is like 2019, I went back. 
and learned more about the land, the, the fact that they'd been displaced from their land. Um, so they lived in one settlement and then were moved to another under apartheid because um, it was deemed to be too good for them. Um, and so I'm still sort of collecting stories because so I'm, I'm not really quite sure where to start. Um, this is um, Uma Katarina and her sister Grit, um, who were the last speakers of the language and who run a language school with, um, uh, you no, know, sort of like within um, a place called um, uh, Rose, Roseburg, which is um, just outside of Uppington. And this is, this is outside of Uppington, so they have, I mean, they have the same things they have all over the world, these trees for the, uh, look, look, look like trees, but they're mobile phone things, and also a Spanish company that, um, you know, because this is, the, 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 this is a uh, solar power um, collecting unit. And you just think, well, there, there, there they are, here we are in this you know, global um, situation with climate change and things, and, and then they have access to all this light, but then in the same way, somebody else comes in and takes over the control of that, and so they have no ownership, um, even though it's their home. Um, I'm rushing through this now because <laughs> I realise I'm almost out of time. But one of the things I wanted to say um, about um, Una and Uma Kais and the, the language school was um, they're, they're, they mean, like, they, 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 this is part of their story, is that um, Una says, my sister and I had gone to Johannesburg with the Baines and our grandparents. When we left, we left everything behind, was well covered with an umbrella of thorn and fastened with twi uh, tight wire twine. Near Box Pits, a big red dune, this is where my father is, with his, where my mother found my father. My sister Kais and I were brought back early from Johannesburg to the Kalahari as a servant to cook for Mr. Bain. Mr. Bain fell in love with Kais and Baines didn't want to mix amongst the bushmen. We staved in the cave that went dry where old Guggenheim's constables looked after us. And, um, and Kais says, my mother asked old Guggenheim, why, sir, did you kick Taiti, who did not come to you to fight? He merely came to ask nicely about our homes. We had our clothing and things there as well. He said, not tomorrow now, take your things and hit the road. And so we turned away. My father had been lying in jail for three days when he could not walk. Then he walked. Then he died because of that kick. That's how we lost our father. And because they went away to the Johannesburg um, Empire Exhibition, when they came back, they were thrown off. They used to live on, on, on what is now parkland, um, but they were thrown off the parkland and were forced to go and work for the local people in order to you know, get food. Um, and, and they were also not allowed to speak their language, which is how the language is lost. And also because um, to be, and, and they, they do refer to themselves as, as Bushmen, to be, to, to be within that community is to, is at that time was regarded as, um, you know, to be lesser than a person. And, and, and you also have to remember, like in 1972, um, was it 90, yeah, 1972? You were still allowed to shoot people, um, and they, you, so if you you're, if you're not allowed to live on your own land, and and, and when, when I spoke to Andres, he said the saddest thing is that my mother and father could not speak, could always speak their own language. They spoke both Nam and Bushman, but as kids we had to learn only Afrikaans because it was the white man's tongue. We had to speak so everyone could understand everything we said. That is my most sore spot to this day because I see the importance of language, of the language that was taken away. If we could have spoken my mother's tongue, I would have been a strong man today. Instead, I feel small and scarred. I mean, the, the idea of, of the, the thing about, that interested me about language was the fact that it, um, it, it, um, it not only talk, you know, talks about um, your culture, but it also talks about the land and the environment. There are words in every language that refer to that space. And if you lose those words, you lose that connection with the land. If you lose that connection with the land, you lose the understanding of the plants, the animals, the seasons, and, and you, you end up mistreating it because you don't understand it. And I think that's something we, we as you know, a whole global world need to reflect on now of what we have lost and how what remains can be regained and, re and retained. 
Um, breaking barriers, and, I mean, I, I have really run out of time, so I'm <laughs> going, going to quickly go through. But breaking barriers um, was a commission from Black Cultural Archives, which was quite recent, in 2019. And, um, and it was about the, the representation of um, or me making portraits of, um, of a very um, honorable and amazing women, five, four or five amazing women, black women, who have made huge differences um, in the UK. And I wanted to present them um, in, within their power. And so I went back and I looked at, photo at paintings in the National Portrait Gallery and representations of power, and they always were white men. And whenever there were people of color, they were always represented as something else, either exotic or, you know, sort of like the framing. Um, I wanted to, to relook at the, re the framing, but not also, I mean, there weren't that many um, images of women from that period. So, I mean, I was actually looking at the colonial period, sort of like a 17th, 18th century, 19th century. And so for my um, touchstones, I always have like a, a couple of images that I look at and I stick up on my notice board to refer to. So every time I'm thinking about how I'm going to picture someone to actually go back to these and um, think about how I would show them. And I also looked at a work that I'd made earlier um, for uh, Pallant House Gallery, which was called the Amberley Queens, um, which was based on the original Amberley panels, um, um, which is uh, now in, um, in the cathedral in, in Chichester. So, so I wanted to look at women in, in, in their power or to make images of women in their power. Um, because, and, and I used those um, as, a, as a reference for these um, amazing women that I worked with. So obviously there was Baroness La, uh, Lawrence and, I, and they were two-sided portraits as well. So there was a back and a front so you could walk around them. Um, uh, uh, Linda Dobbs, um, who was the first uh, black judge in this country. Um, uh, Maggie Adarin Pocock, um, who is a scientist, space scientist. And of course, uh, Shirley Thompson, who is a fantastic uh, composer and uh, concert. Um, musician. And this is my last project I'm going to go through very quickly. Alongside Matron Bell um, was, came out of the work that I did for University College, uh, University Hospital in Lewisham, um, which was celebrating 60 years of the NHS some time ago. And when I was doing my research, I came across lots of images of um, people of colour within the archive. And I wanted to revisit those in some way. And I think with all the things that happened last year, um, I, I wanted to make a piece of work, and it sort of um, came out as a small little booklet, um, which is an online thing, of course. So in 2008, I was commissioned by Lewisham Hospital to make a work celebrating 60 years of the NHS, and then, and, and I made a work called Matron Bell. And so what I wanted to do was to make a piece of work that looked at alongside the people that worked alongside Matron Bell in the building up of the NHS and and continuing. Um, to help the NHS exist in our time and provide um, care for us all. And, and that was very important um, last year to make this work. And also because many of those people came um, after the Second World War and were the Windrush generation. And, and I was also thinking about all the things that happened uh, around that, which we're all aware of in this room. Um, and I think what was important was that everybody, they came and they did all those things, they gave up their homes but we don't remember their names. And one of the things I would have liked to, had I had time, was to, um, to, to, to find some of the people in those pictures. And then maybe that's a project yet to come. Um, Seeds of Empire, I don't really have time really to talk about, but it's an exhibition I've, I've just shown at Daniel Arno Gallery. We showed one iteration of it. And, and it is an exploration between a relationship of Hans Sloan's collection at um, Natural History Museum and the legacy of the indigenous and enslaved people of Jamaica um, and contemporary medicine. That's how it started out, uh, the relationship between those two. And of course, you know, I've, I've, I've got shortlisted for uh, commission to do the Mary Seacole um, statue many, many years ago. And, and it's sort of like fed into that. So go to go back and look at those things. I'd, I mean, I'd love to go back into the um, herbarium again and to look at, at Sloan stories. But it's something that um, I'm going to continue. And the work that came out this time um, was based on this like ongoing research. And I think the thing about my practice is it's a long, long 
story and a long practice. Um, and each project takes many years. And, and like, so, if, but if I'm asked to make a piece of work, I can actually make a piece of work um, fairly quickly. But it, it's because it's, I'm reading and I'm looking and I'm thinking constantly about the work. So these are some of the images from the, the exhibition at Danielle Arno Gallery. Um, of, and, and what we did is we took two, um, two texts from Hans Sloane's work, uh, writing, um, one relating to um, the character of Rose and uh, another of, of the weather, and we conflated them together to make a, a two-part installation. So with two films and um, and and um, so what, and and the voices of uh, people from Jamaica that had come here over since Windrush time talking about their first experiences of being here in the UK. And I think that's that's it. I think I I would have liked to show you some of the film, but I don't think I really have time for that. Are we going to show some of the film? Um, there, I think there is, I mean, I think there's a relationship between the two. If you think that the Memory and Skin was made in um, 1997 and uh, A Little Breeze was made this year. Thank you, Danielle, for uh, enabling that to happen. Um, but I think because they pick up on similar issues, whereas I think with Memory and Skin, it was me. Um, trying to, uh, I, th I suppose, understand or sort of like, it was my first experience of being in the Caribbean. I was like, and I was like a young woman traveling around with this backpack and every country I went to was different, but yet the same. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, that, and that, but now but with um, a little breeze, we didn't go, we, we did it here, um, but it was used, I mean, I suppose all the time, we're always drawing on that, that knowledge um, and that experience. I mean, I, I mean, I say that um, the research for memory and skin was absolutely profound for me because, I, you know, when you, you stay in this island and you stay in Europe, um, you don't know what the experience of the world is for other people. It's sort of, I mean, it doesn't matter how many news reports you listen to or how much, how many films you might watch. It doesn't, it can't touch you in the same way as sitting on a pavement in the sun or, in the shade with, uh, with someone telling you what, what their life is. Um, and I, and I, th I think I was really shell-shocked when I came back. I was very emotional. I had to be met by someone at the airport. <laughs> I was so, um, I suppose, so shocked when I came back here. Are we going to show some? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. 
So it, uh, it was just a little clip, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have run out of time, haven't I? But so can we ask some questions? Yes, I am around if so people want to ask questions. questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Priyash, for introducing me and hosting, and, and thank you, National Portrait Gallery, and um, uh, the Art Festival for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you.